Hello everyone. My name is Simon Almond, and uh, I work at uh, BlaBlaCar as a system engineer. I've been working there uh, for three years now, and uh, today I'd like to give you a feedback uh, on our big shift to containers. So first, uh, I will start with some facts and figures about BlaBlaCar uh, and about our infrastructure and a bit of history of what was before. Then uh, I'd like to present you some key principles, uh, the, the principles that led this transformation at Berbaka. And uh, I will finish with a, a big overview of our uh, infrastructure and uh, go a bit into details into the tools that we have to manage this infrastructure. So first, BlaBlaCar, I think most of you know about it. Uh, so just a reminder, we're, uh, we're doing long-distance carpooling with a community of 40 million members. What you might not know is that we were funded in 2006, so now we have uh, our share of legacy also in, uh, <laughs> in the infrastructure. And uh, we're present in 22 countries, so that's uh, another challenge because we have countries as far as Russia or Brazil. About, uh, about the infrastructure, uh, we started with uh, very small in 2006 with a simple web hosting, then some dedicated servers. And uh, at some point, uh, while the cloud wasn't too re really ready at that, uh, that time, so we decided to go to bare metal servers, so buying one rack in, a, in the data center. Uh, up to now, in uh, 2016, we're at 17 racks in three data centers. Uh, and we have even a new data center now in Moscow uh, with two racks. Uh, so uh, now we're, we're running about uh, 300 bare metal servers, and uh, for, the, uh, for that we're building about 400 container images for a total of more than uh, 4,000 containers running. About the tech evolution at Berbaka, while the major changes were uh, probably in 2012, the virtualization, even if it did concern only a small part of the infrastructure. Uh, then uh, we started having configuration management with Chef in 2013. Uh, Foreman for automating the installation of servers in 2014. And in 2015, we started industrializing the, the way we did with hardware. And we're also starting uh, doing containers. So uh, there was a, clearly a shift in 2015. So to give you more information about uh, why we did this, uh, I'd like to give you the principles that were uh, leading uh, that, uh, uh, that shift that we made. Uh, first, we wanted to make the metal invisible, meaning that we are spending too much time uh, dealing with the, with the servers. Uh, at that time, we, we, we had uh, something like eight, eight racks. And uh, when we needed a new service, or when the service uh, needed to scale, we needed to buy new servers to install them one by one. That would take weeks. So uh, it wasn't really a good solution. Uh, we could have go, went to the cloud at that time, but the problem is that when you're building an application only on bare metal servers, it's not really fit to switch uh, 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 by sniping your, uh, your fingers uh, directly to the cloud. So we decided to, st uh, to stick to the bare metal, but uh, to buy only two or three models of servers, right now we have only two, to buy one rack at a time, so uh, that we can give the job of uh, racking the servers, cabling, etc., uh, to someone else, and the engineers don't need to go to the data center anymore. Uh, so when you are having only a few models of servers, really th the idea is to, to change of paradigm, where uh, we want uh, to adapt the workloads to servers, and not to adapt uh, servers to workloads. Uh, and well, after that, we're, we're thinking that well, if, if we can make this work, well, maybe later uh, we could uh, go to the cloud or something, but well, we'll have to check if it's cheaper. Then uh, the other principle was concerning the network. Uh, we wanted something simple and something that would scale. 
That means uh, we don't want any more uh, layer two on the whole data center. We wanted to root uh, to the rack, so meaning that the top of the rack switch is also a router. Uh, and another very big change, uh, if you consider uh, uh, container solutions uh, at that time, that we don't want NAT. Uh, we want one IP per pod, and uh, we, we don't want to, to do NAT at the host level, but we don't want either to do NAT uh, at the data center uh, level, meaning that our servers don't have access to internet. Instead, we use proxies. So that allows us to really identify which service needs an, uh, an internet access, who is talking to who, uh, so that also makes a better security. And the third principle uh, is to remove snowflakes. That's another way of saying that we want cattle, not pets. Uh, really, the, the, the big point here we want to, to tackle uh, is that we want to be able to reboot any instance at any time of any service. Uh, or we want, uh, we want uh, everything being able to fail, the, the hardware, the, the service, the host, everything, uh, and, uh, but still being able to serve BlaBlaCar uh, without any problem. And actually, a uh, little anecdote on, on this. Uh, we had an unexpected help from uh, our hardware manufacturer. And they provided us with a really interesting firmware uh, that was doing a kind of chaos monkey. So every once in a while, uh, servers would reboot randomly. So they didn't tell us, of course, before. And uh, well, when you think uh, when you think of it, it's, uh, it's really a pain to seeing your servers reboot uh, completely randomly. But uh, it was really uh, 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 interesting that uh, instead of uh, just focusing on uh, uh, finding the problem, we're also focusing on uh, how can we make things more reliable in the meantime, because uh, we can't just hope that we'll fix very quickly the, 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 the issue. So it really helped us to uh, uh, to build resilience uh, in the whole infrastructure. And eventually, we found out that it was uh, the firmware uh, which was causing those reboots. And uh, the hardware manufacturer provided us with another firmware, which fixed everything. <laughs> and all of this is, uh, also uh, uh, changes the way of uh, considering uh, your servers and the service that run on it. Instead of being host-centric, uh, we want to be more uh, service-oriented, meaning that uh, we want service discovery. When, uh, when an instance of a service pops up, we want uh, it to, to report itself automatically so the other services can uh, join it immediately. And we also want uh, service-based monitoring, meaning that uh, if we lose only one, uh, one instance of a service, we don't want to be alerted. Uh, we just care about the whole service. So we want to be alerted only if uh, we lost completely the service or if the service is endangered because the, there are too few instances running for it. So now, uh, uh, following those principles, uh, I'll present you the, the new infrastructure ecosystem that, uh, that we've made at BlaBlaCar. So first, well, no surprise here, containers. Uh, otherwise, I think I wouldn't be here. Uh, so that's our answer to the hardware abstraction. Since we are having the, the same hardware everywhere, and uh, we want to make it invisible, remember? So we need a, an abstraction layer between the hardware and what's running on it. We could have gone for the, for the virtualization, because we already had virtualization, but it was very small at the Raka, so we'd have to rethink it from, uh, from the beginning. So uh, it, it wasn't the, the best choice for us at, at that moment because containers were taking off and uh, it was a much better approach, we thought. Uh, so we started experimenting with containers in early 2015. And uh, by the end of 2015, 80% of the production was migrated to, to containers. 
then to run those containers, I thought that maybe we don't need the, the distribution that we had uh, till then. So we started looking at the other distributions, and there was CoreOS Container Linux, uh, which seemed much more easier to maintain and to uh, install. And it was made to run containers, and that's what we wanted, because we didn't want to do containers only for a part of our infrastructure, uh, because otherwise we would have uh, one side, the legacy part, uh, running the old stuff, you know, and on the other part, the new shiny thing with containers. Uh, I think that's a, that's a bad approach. We are a relatively small uh, company, relatively small team, so we, we have to focus all our effort in one direction, and uh, we decided to go all in on, on containers. Uh, and CoreOS was also a really good way to enforce this because you can't run uh, anything else than containers uh, on CoreOS. So that, that was uh, uh, the, the perfect OS for that. Uh, and it's also been very stable for us. A small anecdote about that. Uh, I recently found a, a, a VM that was running CoreOS and uh, that was installed, uh, I had installed uh, in early 2015 for the, uh, some tests and running some containers. And uh, my surprise was when I logged into this VM uh, two weeks ago, uh, it was running CoreOS Alpha in the latest version because it had updated itself and uh, the containers were still there. It, uh, they, were, they had survived and rebooted uh, uh, after, after each update. So uh, it was pretty amazing to see that uh, even CoreOS Alpha uh, uh, had lasted uh, such a long time. And then uh, we uh, chose to, to use Rocket as our, our production runtime for containers for everything, including uh, stateful services. And when I say everything, uh, meaning the uh, MariaDB, Cassandra, and the databases that we have at Babacar. And uh, I think we are one of the biggest uh, Rocket deployments in production. Uh, so why we chose Rocket? Uh, mainly because from uh, the beginning, it was designed for production. Uh, there's no demand. It's uh, system debased. It's very, the code is, is pretty easy to, to understand. They don't try to do too many things. They, they do one thing and they, and they do it right. It's really modular. They, uh, for instance, they have a CNI from the network, container network interface. They have customizable stage one, meaning that uh, they can uh, run containers using system D spawn. But they can also uh, run uh, VMs uh, using a uh, stage one uh, KVM or a basic CH route. Uh, we even have a customized uh, stage one uh, for our uh, tool that builds uh, container images. So it's, uh, it's really modular for that, and, and we like it. It also su supports pods, and uh, that's something that we wanted because we, we like the, the idea of having only one process per container, but at some point you want to have several processes in the same context, so uh, supporting pod is also a good thing. And a few things like uh, having a pre-start uh, to doing some stuff before running the main process or uh, dealing with the uh, dependency in the images. Basically, it supports all the features that you could expect from a container runtime. And uh, it even supports uh, Docker images. Uh, the cons of these solutions are, well, it's, uh, there are no tools for the devs, so we had to make our own tooling. And uh, it's, uh, it's a bit more difficult to make it adopted by uh, the developers because uh, well, we don't have the same uh, power as the marketing from uh, other solutions. And it's also less integrated uh, with other actors. Uh, like, for instance, the integration in, in Kubernetes uh, is not, uh, not, not as good as uh, uh, you could expect. About the tools that we make, uh, when we started doing containers, well, there weren't many tools to do uh, basically anything. And we didn't want to lose uh, the flexibility that we had with configuration management and uh, tools like Chef. So basically what we've done is, was to create a task force uh, within, the, within the architecture team at Rebecca to create a workflow and to, uh, to decide how we could work with, uh, uh, 
with all this uh, eco uh, new ecosystem, how could we build the ecosystem? And we did workshops with the whole team to validate, well, is it working okay for you guys? Uh, how, how do we build, con uh, we, dec they, to, to, we decided to build containers with this, this, and this, uh, what do you think? And we were uh, doing uh, well, some workshops to validate all this. Well, the first time it was really not good. <laughs> Uh, we're doing bash scripts, etc. We're doing some chef in containers. Well, tons of bad ideas. A lot of iterations uh, later, where we decided to go for our own tools. And uh, for instance, to build container images, we created Digger. So it's a container build uh, and runtime tool. And the, the criteria that we had in mind uh, while building this tool were that we wanted a quick build. We don't want it to last forever. Like uh, the first iteration when we were using Chef uh, to build uh, container images, it was really too long to build an image. That's why uh, we didn't keep uh, uh, this solution. Uh, but uh, more important, we wanted one way of doing things because what we were seeing at that time was uh, many people doing containers images, but uh, each time in a different way, uh, even sometimes in the same company, people would build the container images in different ways. So we uh, wanted really one way of doing things, uh, something uh, uh, where, if possible, easy to understand for newcomers, uh, something that would uh, take care of all the templating of the configuration files, because we wanted to use the same container image in different contexts. And uh, we wanted a good integration of the rocket. Uh, so we made the digger, uh, which is based uh, on the Apsis uh, spec also, because we wanted to use directly the image from Rocket instead of using uh, Docker images. Uh, for a simple reason, is that uh, the format uh, is really easy to, to understand. It's a simple tar file. Uh, so here you have the build directory uh, of a, an image. Uh, so you have uh, the standard structure, and you can see that it's really, it's really inspired by uh, configuration management. Uh, you will find the attributes, run level, where, where you have the scripts, and uh, all the templates. Uh, then, uh, we have, uh, in, a, in a manifest, uh, we have a simple format in YAML, and we only have to define uh, the minimal things. For instance, if I want to do a Redis image, I just uh, give the name of the image and what process I want to run. Uh, we can also use uh, dependencies. Uh, like here, if I don't want a Redis image with the whole distribution in it, uh, and uh, let's say that I want the Debian package, well, I will put uh, Debian as a dependency. And uh, that way, I won't, uh, I won't have the Debian files in the, in the image. Uh, then, uh, the, on the build part, so we have uh, different run levels. Uh, one uh, is the build run level, and uh, the build run level uh, contains all the scripts that are executed insi from inside the container with all the dependencies. Uh, so, for instance, uh, in the case of our Redis container, uh, we just have a file in the, uh, in the build run level saying uh, apt-get install uh, Redis server. And uh, I uh, consider that I already have Debian because it's in my dependencies. And I don't even have to update or to clean after because uh, uh, it's also done uh, in other run levels in the, in the Debian image. So I will inherit from all the, all the apt-get update and all the cleaning uh, afterwards. Then I have a, another run level, which is called Builder, uh, and which is slightly different, because in that case, I will build from outside of the container. Uh, so here I have an example with a, a, Go, uh, a Go application. That's a Blurica application uh, for doing uh, uh, Redis clusters uh, with elections uh, using Zookeeper, which is called Redis Dictator. Uh, so here we have a builder, and the dependency of the builder will be go and git. Uh, and so in the, in the scripts uh, of the builder, I will just git clone 
uh, Redis Dictators uh, repository, go build uh, the application, and then copy the binary into the root file system of the container image. Uh, and uh, in the end, uh, in, the, in the image, I will have only the binary uh, for Redis Dictator, but not the whole uh, build uh, environment uh, with Go and uh, etc. Another thing that we can do uh, for uh, distributions that have a package manager which allows to install in another uh, target for the, uh, which has another target for installation, for instance, Gen2, is that we can use uh, Gen2 state 4 for dependencies, uh, for builder dependencies, and then just uh, emerge uh, Redis server. And uh, the target will be the, the root FS of the, uh, of the target uh, uh, image. And in, uh, in the image, I will have only a Redis server and its dependency, but not a whole distribution. Uh, then uh, Digger also takes care of all the templating. So basically, the idea here is to have the templates and all the default attributes stored in the image, but not rendered at the build time. Instead, we're doing the rendering uh, during the pre-start of the container. And uh, that's very important because that allows us to uh, override uh, the attributes that we put by default uh, in, the, in the image, uh, either uh, using dependency, because uh, if I use uh, the, uh, dependency of uh, an image, I can override in the, uh, the attributes, or I can also override with environment variable uh, during the, during the pre-start. So here is an example. It's, uh, it's using Go templating. And uh, I, uh, let's say that I want to customize the Redis port in the redis.conf uh, file, uh, and that the default will be uh, 6379. Uh, and then we have other run levels. I won't tell you all the run levels that we have because we have taken care of lots of use cases. But that one uh, is, uh, is pretty important. It's uh, pre-start. We have pre-start early and pre-start late. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, run before the templating uh, is rendered, and the other one is run after. And uh, we use them to uh, do all sorts of tasks that we want to do to prepare the container before we run the main process. And last but not least, we have testing. Uh, because if you can test, well, uh, it's a bit difficult after that to, uh, to put that in your continuous integration and so on. Uh, so what we do is only uh, batch testing. So I know it's pretty basic, but it works. So what we have, basically, we will have a wait.sh script that will just watch uh, for, the, for the container to be ready to be tested, and, and then uh, the bats file. So here is an example. Uh, let's say that I want to check if a Redis server is running in the container and that it's uh, listening on the right port. So to sum up uh, a few uh, digger commands, we have a digger init to uh, initialize the directory structure that I just presented. Uh, so it's easier to, to develop. Digger try with only uh, do the templating resolution. That's why you can test your templates before building everything, because sometimes the build time is pretty long. And if you've just done a typo in, the, in your templates, well, you don't want to run the build each time, the digger build, do the actual build. The digger test, well, I don't have to explain. Uh, digger install will put the image in the, local, uh, in the rocket uh, local store, and digger push will push it uh, uh, in a re repository. So of course, digger uh, is on GitHub. You can check it out. Uh, and then well, I spoke about how we uh, were building images, but now how do we run the, those images? Because at that time, there was not no real solution for uh, our scale uh, to run uh, containers uh, in production. So we decided to go with Fleet. Uh, Fleet basically uh, is a distributed uh, uh, system that will just launch uh, system day units on a cluster of servers. So it's really simple, but well, it works. 
so what we wanted to do with GGN was an abstraction on the top of Fleet uh, to take care of uh, defining the environments and uh, the services that we wanted to run on uh, our production. So uh, here is the directory structure. We have one directory structure for everything uh, that we run in production. Uh, we'll define an environment. Here is it's prod DC1. Then uh, the attributes uh, relative to the, that environment. Let's say that I have a specific uh, DNS server. I have a specific zookeeper for the whole environment. And then uh, the services uh, uh, that we want to run. Let's say that I want to, to run a, a Redis quota service, so I will have the attributes, a service manifest, and a, a unit template. So all of this uh, will be uh, version in Git, so the whole team can, uh, can work on the, on the same base uh, for the launching and defining new services. So uh, just a quick look at what a service manifest looks like. So that's a minimal service manifest. Uh, here, I want to launch a pod with a Redis uh, image and a Redis exporter to uh, uh, put metrics in Prometheus, for instance. And I want a three nodes, uh, uh, a three nodes cluster. Then I will have the attributes. So let's say here I want to override the max memory of the uh, of the Redis uh, instance. So from these attributes. Uh, GGN uh, will create uh, the environment variables to override uh, the attributes, uh, the default attributes uh, in the Redis image. And then I have the uh, unit template. Uh, so the unit template contains uh, well, the, the rocket run uh, command with the, the override attributes and the list of the uh, of image that uh, we want to run. In the end, the uh, only command that we have to run will be a, a GGN uh, prod DC1 for the environment, Redis quota for the service update, and it will just check if the service already exists uh, in the production. If yes, it will check if it needs to be updated, and in that case, it will just take one node at a time and update it and then put it back. Uh, or if it doesn't exist, it will just deploy all the all the nodes. And uh, the good thing that with JGN you can also uh, uh, use all the fleet commands, like uh, to check the journal, for instance, uh, of a specific instance of a service. And then a uh, very uh, key piece of our infrastructure is the service discovery. Because when you have containers uh, that are popping everywhere, at, at time you, can't, you can't just rely on a static configuration. You can't rely on DNS, everything. So you need, uh, you need something that can adapt uh, in real time. Uh, so what we've done it was to uh, start with the Airbnb smart stack, uh, which was called uh, Synapse and Nerve. But uh, since then, we've improved it a lot. And uh, we rewrote it in Go, so it's called now Go Synapse and Go Nerve because we have a lot of inspiration in the in the team for naming, uh, and basically it works like that. So when a service wants to talk to another one, let's say a database, uh, it will have a local HA proxy in the same pod. Uh, then we will have the Go, Go Synapse Zookeeper and Go Nerve uh, each time. So the Go nerve, which, which will be in the same pod of the database, will check if the database is OK, if it's up and running, etc. And uh, it will report to uh, a key in Zookeeper. Let's say that the key it's called, is called database in that case. It will report that this particular instance of the, uh, of the service database is up and running. And then in Go Synapse, which is located in the same pod of the first service and the HA proxy, will also check the path database in Zookeeper, and it will update uh, the HA proxy uh, directly. So in that case, 
if there is any change that, uh, on the database size, or if the nerve uh, can't reach the zookeeper, or anything happens, uh, well, the database node 1 will disappear from uh, zookeeper, and then uh, the Go Synapse will be notified, will update the HA proxy, and the node 1 will, will, uh, will not be used anymore uh, for the, by the other services. So that's, uh, re that's really that our Chaos Monkey proof uh, system. Or so if anything has happened, uh, everything, uh, the, the HA proxy or in the world infrastructure are updated directly, and uh, it continues to work. So to, to sum up a bit uh, all of this, uh, we'll have uh, the bare metal servers. So, uh, like I said, we have only uh, one type of server. We, sometimes we have different profiles for the disks, but uh, we try to limit that. Then we have the, the abstractions with, uh, with CoreOS and Fleet, which, which uh, runs everywhere. And on the top of that, we use uh, GGN to run uh, rocket pods. And uh, in those pods, which are built, uh, contain, it contains images which are built with Digger. And uh, we have here, for instance, two different pods with all the, all the images that run in the same context. And they communicate uh, using the service uh, discovery. Uh, so uh, Nerve on, uh, on one side for the monitoring part, and Synapse to update the HA proxy on, uh, on the other part. So, uh, well, this part is uh, pretty much uh, really work, uh, work in progress, even if it seems that we, we solved a lot of, of problems here. Uh, we try to, to stick uh, always to the, the principles that lead the, the transformation of, the, of this infrastructure. Uh, well, uh, now we exploit what we can do in terms of orchestration and everything, because well, we can think that it's pretty basic to use Fleet and uh, not a real orchestrator, but it's only very recent that uh, things uh, are going uh, very stable for orchestrator. So we don't want to rush too fast. We have something that works that's stable. Uh, our main focus now is more that to open all this platform uh, directly to the developers so they can run their own services without asking uh, someone from uh, system engineering. Uh, we want them to be completely autonomous, to start their services, to monitor their services. Uh, and then we want the, the system engineers to be only here to create the tooling, improve the tooling, and uh, help the developers when, uh, when they have a problem, but not uh, doing the, all, the, all the job uh, of uh, taking care of, uh, of the platform. So that's a, a big shift. Uh, it has also uh, its challenges, like how do we have uh, uh, devs uh, on call, and uh, or, uh, how do you decide if a, if a team is ready to, uh, to deal with uh, a part of the production or not. So uh, I think that uh, we can go for the questions, I wanted to, to have some, uh, some time so for, for the questions you, you could have. You can also ask questions in French. In French, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the really insightful talk. Uh, I have a few, que a few questions. Uh, how are you feeling about using Fleet since it has been deprecated officially by CoWS for two months now? Well, it has been deprecated, but uh, for about two months, but it wasn't updated uh, for, <laughs> I'd say, like at least one year. Uh, but one well, of the things works. <laughs> and uh, even if it doesn't get any updates, uh, well, we still have time. Uh, I think we have a lot of time to find another solution uh, and to migrate uh, without uh, rushing to something that would be as stable as what we have right now. Okay, thanks. Um, another one. Uh, why did you create GoNav and GoSynapse since it's essentially doing 
exactly the same thing as console and console templates does. Well, I'm not sure that it was doing exactly the same thing at the time that uh, when we, we created GoNerve and GoSynapse. And uh, here I only presented a very uh, high level stuff that we do with, uh, with GoNerve and, uh, and GoSynapse, but it's also taking care of lots of small things like uh, uh, our databases couldn't run uh, in production in containers without uh, the, all the specific features that we've developed in, uh, in GoNav and GoSynapse uh, to gracefully uh, put them in productions with warming up of the, with taking care of the warm up and, uh, and gracefully take them out of productions. All, all the stuff that we, we've developed in, the, in those tools uh, uh, do not exist in most of the service discovery solutions that, uh, that exist. Thanks. And um, can I ask one more? And thanks for introducing my, ne my next question. Uh, since you're running 100% on containers, what databases are, uh, databases are you running on? How are you handling storing data? S sorry? Uh, on, uh, how are you on, uh, what databases are you using? Yeah. And how are you okay. storing your data since you're 100% on containers? Well, uh, all the data is stored locally on uh, each server. We don't use... Uh, uh, I don't know, NAS or SAN or uh, whatever, we store things locally. And the databases that we have are very, uh, well, we have one for each usage. So let's say for transactional, we have MySQL. For distributed, we have Cassandra. We have uh, Couchbase for storing the sessions, Redis for ephemeral, uh, Elasticsearch for search, Postgres for the geo. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I have all of them, but. Uh, you have the, yeah, the idea. So you were talking about uh, using EPC specification uh, for Digger. Yeah. I'm sure you're informed that uh, the OCI from Linux Foundation is now the future for Rocket. Yeah. So uh, have you studied the, for the shift? And will it be complicated? Mm. Or will you still use EPC mm. even if it's necessary? Rocket will do the transformation from EPC to mm. OCI. Yeah, uh, at, uh, when we saw that the, the OCI would be uh, the next uh, container image format, uh, we are really uh, uh, wanted to, to switch very quickly on, on, on that. But when we realized that it wasn't going to be stable for at least uh, another six months, and uh, uh, I think it's, uh, the stable version will not happen before next year or something like that. So uh, we decided to delay that because it's not a very simple change uh, in, uh, in, the code, uh, in the code of Digger or, or in the code of Rocket. Uh, so we're just watching how things are going with that. And uh, sure, that will be the format that we'll be using in the future, but uh, not before uh, the stable version is released. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm not sure I got your point about the storage. So you are storing locally all the data. So what happens if you lose a node? Well, the resiliency is done at the service level and not on, uh, at the storage level. Meaning that, uh, for instance, for uh, our MySQL database, we're using a synchronous replication with Galera. And if we lose one node, uh, well, uh, when we reboot it somewhere else, it will uh, uh, fetch its data from uh, from the other nodes. So how about the persistent data? I mean, something hosted on the server that need to be used as it is by another node. I mean, like distributed systems or distributed storage. Well, we don't. Well, we have a few examples where we need to have a distributed storage, but that's very few use cases. We have only uh, one or two like that. Uh, all the other, on all the other cases, we uh, we use the replication offered uh, by the application itself, and not uh, replication on the storage uh, level. Right. Uh, another question about when you talk about the snowflakes. So yeah. you moved from uh, you can say pads to cuddles, and uh -huh. did you went through uh, re-engineering all the applications, or uh, it was I mean, how did you manage it? How, how did you manage the, from the application point of view? From the application point of view, well, <laughs> uh, the it 
the, the most difficult thing was not the application, I think, on, on that part, uh, because we have other challenges that we're uh, having with the application, and they are more in terms of decoupling everything in, in terms of service and uh, all of this. But even with our uh, old monolith, uh, we can uh, do that. Uh, uh, we can remove the snowflakes, because if we lose, for instance, uh, uh, a front server, well, uh, we have the other servers to take care of the, of the traffic. Uh, I think that when I, I was talking about the snowflakes, uh, the, the, the real technology that helped us uh, removing the, those snowflakes was the service discovery, because at, at that point, we didn't need any more uh, uh, fixed IPs on a few servers that will uh, do uh, one, that we serve traffic from one type of service. We could, uh, if, we, if needed, we could add more front servers or remove uh, the, the one we didn't want anymore, and uh, every, uh, all the infrastructure would adapt from that. And the application itself, is it also the one server or replicate over, uh, you can say, more servers? Sorry? The application itself, is it hosted yeah. on one server or is it... No, it's, uh, it's always on, on several okay. servers mm -hmm. in different Spread tracks all and uh, all of this. Uh, that's something I, I, I didn't... Uh, presented, right. but for instance, for GGN, we can put some uh, constraints to say that uh, we don't want uh, the applications uh, running on the same servers for the for the same service, or we we want to spread among racks, etc. We can put basic constraints. It's not as uh, advanced as, as things that you could have in, uh, in solutions uh, like Kubernetes and everything, but but we have those uh, basic constraints. The last question, are you considering Docker for uh, the redesign or just sticking to Rocket? So, sorry? Are you considering Docker or uh, you are sticking yeah. to Rocket? Uh, are we considering Rocket or are we considering Rocket? Are you considering? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we are not uh, because we, we've been sitting a lot on, uh, on Rocket. We're pretty happy with it because well, it's, it's stable for us. So I, I don't see any reason uh, for using another runtime, at least for production. Maybe that with uh, things uh, we we get a more bit more flexible for development part and and uh, uh, use Docker for the development part and then uh, transfer the image to run them on our production servers. But uh, but we won't use Docker in production. We had uh, too many feedba bad feedbacks about that. Thank you very much. Another question, I think. Yeah, sorry, one more. Uh, <laughs> uh, you had a step of hardware uniformization before going on containers. So afterwards, now that you've got containers, do you still think this uniformization is needed? Since while well, containers and Docker operations essentially abstract you, your hardware, so you don't really need to have uh, the same thing for everything? Well, the, the thing in hardware uh, uniformization is that it really helps us with dealing with data center operations. Uh, meaning that I just give a, a sheet of paper with how things have to be cabled and everything to, uh, to our contractor. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it gets racked and everything like I, I want it, it to be. So I don't have to go to the data center. And so I have, uh, on one side, it's cheaper than the cloud. Or maybe uh, could get some. Uh, 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 sometimes you can negotiate uh, the, the prices to get uh, to uh, the cloud a bit cheaper. But last time we checked, it was cheaper than the cloud. Now we could switch uh, from cloud to uh, on-prem to whatever. It doesn't matter because we have the containers. Because we have made all, all these adaptations to uh, to be independent from the hardware. So. Uh, the idea is, uh, of course, yes, we could have different servers and everything, but uh, I don't see the point. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.